good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation on the science and technology behind the soil exploration activities in the Delta. So for background, uh, Governor Newsom's State of the State speech in February of 2019, he called upon the Department of Water Resources, DWR, to pursue a new environmental review and planning process for a single tunnel solution to modernize water infrastructure in the Delta. And as part of this process, DWR will soon begin soil explorations. Here to talk about this interesting and important work are two of the project's lead engineers, Prabha Prabharuban and Andrew Finney. Prabha is a principal engineer with DWR. He currently leads and oversees the engineering aspects of the Delta Conveyance Program. Prabha has more than 20 years of experience in the design and construction of civil infrastructure projects and is a registered civil and geotechnical engineer in the state of California. Andrew is the field work and geotechnical lead with the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Authority, or DCA. Andrew has over 25 years of experience working primarily on geotechnical aspects of water projects, including reservoirs, pump stations, pipelines, intakes, outfalls, levee crossings, and conveyance tunnels. He was the geotechnical engineer of record for numerous Delta projects from the Freeport water intake in the north to the Mariposa Energy Project in the south. He also is a registered civil and geotechnical engineer in the state of California. So let's move to question one and Prabha, I'd like to start with you. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing about the science and technology behind the soil investigations. But before we get to that, tell us a little bit about their purpose. Sure. Thank you, Pat. Uh, that's a great question and a timely question to start this discussion. As you know, we are getting ready to start uh, soil explorations for this year for this program within the next couple of weeks. So the purpose of uh, the soil explorations is to determine the suitability of surface and subsurface conditions for construction and also to evaluate potential impacts from construction activities. Understanding the location, composition and properties of soils is an important part of environmental analysis as well as the engineering design activities. So Andrew, as the geotechnical lead at DCA, you are conducting field work over a very large area. Uh, the Delta is over a thousand square miles. How do you decide where to survey? Yeah, thanks, Pat. That's a good question. So when we look at the Delta, uh, I think in general, there's a lack of deep subsurface data in certain sections of the Delta. Um, I think the deepest data comes from explorations conducted by, by other agencies, uh, and, and I think for water wells too, but those aren't always very well documented. So what we do is we, we've, we've assembled a database of available subsurface data from past projects and from the water wells. And we've graded all that data with regards to its usefulness and key characteristics such as its depth. And then we use that in conjunction with the proposed project corridors that are developed as part of the environmental work uh, to identify the data gaps. Then once we've identified those data gaps, we, we attempt to site explorations in public right of way or state property. Uh, that's our preference. And then where these are unavailable, we, we propose to conduct site explorations in private parcels with uh, approval of the, of the owners. And obviously with a consideration towards the land use of the parcel, is it in farming, is it residential, is it, uh, you know, is it a vineyard? and also with an eye towards minimizing disruptions to the owners and their tenants. Okay, thank you. Um, so Andrew, continuing on with you, I've, I've read that, you know, from a geologic perspective, the Delta has a really interesting past um, and it's seen a lot of changes in a relatively short amount of time, geologically speaking. Could you quickly take us through some of that deep prehistory of the area? Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, 
the the geologic history of the of the delta is, is actually fascinating and it's it's really been shaped by dramatic swings in our climate uh, our global climate and california's seismic forces uh, here on the west coast in ancient times the entire central valley was a massive lake known as corcoran lake uh, that was filled with snow melt from the sierra's extensive glaciers and initially, this lake drained into the ocean through a valley near present-day Monterey. And bit by bit, the valley filled with fine clays that were settling out of, the, uh, out of the glacial melt. However, seismic activity raised the coastal mountains and plugged off this outlet. And, you know, with the, the, the ice continued to melt and melt. And ultimately, the, the lake began to carve a new outlet to the ocean. And at some point, uh, geologists only recently have, have recognized this, that coastal barrier collapsed in a cataclysmic outrush of water that ultimately carved the Carquinas Strait as we know it today. So that, that's the sort of big picture. Now, now let's move into sort of uh, still ancient history. 14,000 years ago, the Pacific Ocean, the coast, was out near the Farallon Islands, and the delta was a gentle, gentle plain that uh, drained the Sierra Nevada mountains. And after the end of the last ice age, sea level began to rise rapidly. So, and when I say rapidly, I mean one foot every 20 years or so. And this began to the march of seawater, uh, the ocean essentially marched its way into the Delta. About 7,000 years ago, that slowed down to, um, to, to essentially became somewhat stabilized and the Delta shoreline established itself as generally where we think of the Delta today, although it was a, a brackish saltwater um, marsh. And, you know, tules and reeds and organic materials began to, uh, to grow and deposit themselves into thick organic layers and, and the rivers became flatter and the Delta began to fill with, with organic materials and silts and clays from the rivers that drained the, uh, the Sierra Nevada. Probably more than you wanted to know, but it, it just goes to explain that, to show that the Delta has seen some epic changes in its geologic past. So just a quick follow up here. Can you see evidence of some of that history in these samples that you collect? Yeah, we can, Pat. And, and we see that most, most notably, and it's, it's what folks know the Delta for, is, is the thick organic peats that make it such a rich um, agricultural area we see the, that thick sequence of organic peats in the upper superficial soils, but we also see old buried river channels that are, that are um, leftover elements of that gentle floodplain that I talked about. And we even see lenses of volcanic ash from ancient Sierra uh, volcanoes and from volcanoes that were as far north as Oregon. So yeah, the, the, the subsurface information is, is, is fascinating. Great, thank you. Okay, um, I think our next question will go to Prava, and um, you can help us get an idea of exactly what's involved in some of these investigations. Like, what does a soil investigation entail? And I was gonna just touch on a, a couple more questions that maybe you could try to cover in your, in your response here. Like, what do the crews do, and what is a CPT? and what's a borehole, and what kind of equipment do they use, and how wide and deep are these holes? So you just heard from Andrew on how we determine the locations for soil explorations. Once we know the location, we will reach out to the landowners to get access. If it is a private property, we will work with the landowners to get a temporary entry permit. Uh, if it's a publicly owned land, uh, we will apply and get an encroachment from the agency that owns the right of way. Uh, once we get access to the site, we will send a crew consisting of a geologist, a biologist, a cultural resources specialist, and a real estate agent to perform environmental clearance and to stake the location. During this process, um, we work with the landowners, we listen to their concerns and adjust the location to either to avoid or minimize impacts to the existing land use. After we stake the location, we call underground service alert to notify our exploration locations 
um, so that you know our exploration activities won't interfere with the existing utilities. After the locations are cleared for existing utilities, we will mobilize field crews to start the field work. A field crew typically consists of a geologist, an environmental monitor, and a couple of other staff members to operate the equipment. Uh, there are several methods of explorations. We use um, two methods uh, that are commonly used in the industry. They are called uh, corn penetration test or CPT and standard penetration test also known as SPT or BOHO. In a CPT test, uh, an inch and a half instrumented corn is pushed into the ground and soil properties are recorded. Uh, this test doesn't involve drilling and is relatively quick. SPT test involves drilling a hole into the ground and perform sampling at regular intervals, typically every five feet. A borehole would be about six to eight inches in diameter. Depth of boreholes and CPTs vary based on the purpose of the data we collect. Uh, for the Delta Conveyance Project, uh, typical depths vary from 75 feet to 300 feet. We follow the relevant ASTM standards to perform these tests. Um, Land-based CPTs and boreholes are typically performed using truck-mounted uh, drill rigs or CPT rigs. Um, Andrew, let's let's turn to you um, about time frame. Like, how long does it take to complete one of these surveys and for the field work? You know, how long are you are you typically on a site? It's dependent on the number of explorations um, and the depth of explorations. But for cone penetrometer tests, I mean, they're relatively quick. It would be a matter of hours, uh, and then you would route that cone penetrometer up and be off the site. Uh, or onto the next location. For soil borings, depending on the depth, it could be on the order of uh, two days to up to 13 days for a very deep borehole, but, but typically sort of, you know, less than less than two weeks. So just sticking with you, Andrew, kind of following up here, once you get all these core samples and the data from the CPT, um, what's, what's after that? What do you do with all of that material and with the data, like how are the samples used and what do they really tell us and, and how are they processed and how does that analysis um, go into the final environmental review? Right, right. So probably touched on this a little bit with, with the purpose of the soil borings and obviously the, the goal is to, is to address that purpose. But the soil samples and the data from the CPT uh, are used in the field initially to characterize the soil conditions. Is it sand? Is it clay? Where are the transitions between layers and sand? Is there gravel down there? Is it one of those buried river channels? Uh, for the engineering properties, such as strength, permeability, compressibility of the soils, the, um, the engineer would then select soil samples for additional laboratory testing. And, and the lab testing is conducted at off-site uh, soil testing laboratories. The, the results ultimately are used to refine facility descriptions and construction methods for the environmental impact uh, report alternatives. For example, you know, soil types, strength, the age, the permeability, the presence of groundwater uh, will be used to determine the extent of pre-construction ground improvement, for instance, which is, a, is a, an important uh, element of the work, uh, or methods to reduce potential settlement or uh, develop seismic design criteria and predict how the, the delta will, will behave in, in uh, ground shaking. You know, ultimately without this information, the engineers are forced to make very conservative assumptions which could lead to additional construction activity that might actually be necessary. Uh, and then I think it's worth mentioning too that the geotechnical results the findings of both the lab results and the, the field results will be used in the environmental report to describe what's known as the existing conditions. And, and that's really important because that's used as the basis for the impact analysis for the soils and geology resources portion of the, of the document. Great, thank you. Um, all right, um, Prabha, in, with all of your experience, you know, what could you potentially find? 
So we have completed approximately 300 boreholes and CPDs in the Delta since year 2000 for the Delta Conveyance Program pad. Uh, we also have a lot of historical data collected over the years for other projects in the Delta. Uh, in these situations, what we found um, is that generally, you know, you will find organic and peat soils near the surface up to about 60 feet uh, below surface. And below that, we encountered uh, historic deposits of thousands of years old, consisting of um, dense to very dense granular soils, such as uh, sands, silty sands, clay sands, and stiff uh, blue, hard, uh, fine materials such as clays and sail. Um, you know, it varies as you go from uh, north to south in the delta, but uh, this is the kind of uh, you know, generic um, stratigraphy you will find in the delta. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so, Prabhu, what, what happens to these holes after the core samples are removed? So, after uh, sampling is done, uh, borings are uh, backfilled with grout mix of uh, cement and bentonite, uh, pumped through a tremie pipe from the bottom of the borehole in accordance with the state standard um, and we would do the same for the CPD holes as well. We would pump, um, you know, cement midnight crowd mix from the bottom of the hole, you know, all the way to the top to seal those holes. Okay. Um, well, thank you to our lead engineers for providing some insight into the science and technology behind these soil exploration activities. Stay tuned for more videos on other topics as well. Uh, and you are always welcome to contact us at the DWR website at water.ca.gov. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks, Pat. Thank you.